it's the first time for me to come here in Cape Town. And mashallah, fantastic Muslim community, brilliant food, brilliant people, excellent. Yesterday I had a big debate in Johannesburg. And it's a good thing I left the city because, <laughs> you know, we'll see, inshallah, tonight when the debate comes up or tomorrow. But today we're going to be talking about something very important. But before we do that, I want to say that I want to get through this quickly so that we can make this into a Q&A session, so we can interact with each other, so we can engage with each other a little bit more. The topic of today's discussion is relating to the Qur'an and its relationship to contemporary issues. I'll be honest with you. I find it very interesting that the religion of Islam is the only religion which accurately predicts the state of affairs in the modern period. Now let me explain what I mean by that. There are many religions of the antiquity and the Middle Ages. Yes, ancient religions from a thousand years ago, from a thousand five hundred years ago, from a long time ago. And they seem very much to be religions for their time and their place and their people. Where when you really think about the situation with care, Islam not only provides answers, at least I'm going to claim and try and evidence, for the problems of today in the 21st century, but it proposes the right kind of diagnostic. Let me give you some examples to make this point clearer. I recently came across a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu where he said, in, near the end of time, there will be treachery on the Ummah, and the hadith is long, and it says that the treacherous ones will be trusted. And at the end of the hadith, it says, وَيَظْهَرُوا السَّمَنْ And obesity will become widespread. I was thinking, this is very interesting. This is, it doesn't seem to be something that someone from the 7th century would just think of their, from their head. Then I started looking more about these hadiths, and I came across another hadith, which states the following, that a woman would be afraid of giving birth to a child, to the point where she will remove what's in her stomach, talking about abortions that there will be a proliferation of surgical abortion. Now, I'm not going to the fiqh of that from an Islamic perspective. Is it permissible? When is it permissible? You know, all that kind of thing. I'm not talking about that. This is just saying that this will happen. The Prophet Muhammad told us that the barefooted Arabs will compete for the tall buildings. You know this. Once again, very, very clear situation, very specific diagnostic. The Prophet told us that we will live in an interest-based economy. Very interesting once again. The Prophet ﷺ told us that there will come a time, and this hadith is slightly weak, but interesting. That a man will, be, will suffice himself with another man, and a woman will suffice herself with another woman. And then, interestingly enough, the Prophet told us, that the sa'a will not come, the hour will not come, hatta ta'in al mar'atu zawjaha fi tijara. That until her, the woman, she starts to involve herself in business with her husband. In talking about there's going to be an increase in women in the workforce and business. This seems to be a very, very accurate depiction of today. I mean, what other time is this talking about if not today? What this should do, and this is just giving you a flavor, it should give us and fill us with complete confidence that the legislation and the sharia ah is actually from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because let me tell you something, if you go to a doctor, right, and you want to see a diagnostic, you have some symptoms and you go to the doctor, you say, I've got this problem, this problem, this problem, and he diagnoses you in a certain manner and then gives you a prescription thereafter. And he reassures you with the diagnosis. He says, this is what you have and this is the evidence. Look, you've got MRI scan here, x-ray scan here, your blood test says this. Reassures you with the diagnosis. You're more likely to accept what? The prescription, are you not? You're more likely to accept the prescription. It boggles my mind fully. It boggles my mind 
that the Prophet can be so accurate, not just about what's going to happen in the recent hi history or the recent future to him, but also in the modern time. There's a very powerful hadith in Sahih Muslim in this vein, which relates to there will be a time where the people will be traveling on suruj. Suruj. And they'll be reclining. Suruj is an Arabic word for boats, effectively. It was used commonly for Roman boats sometimes. Interestingly, it's talking about the land. It's not talking about the sea. And it says they'll be reclining on leather chairs inside these, I know, these things. Reclining on leather chairs and women will be coming out with a certain kind of hairstyle outside the masjid. The, the, and it's so specific, unbelievably specific. This is Sahih Muslim, it's hadith. So when you, dis, when you look at this, you know, and even the ayah in the Quran, in Surah Al-Nahl, there is an ayah, you know, uh, which is, وَالْخَيْلَ وَالْبِغَالَ وَالْحَمِيرَ لِتَرْكَبُوهَا وَزِينَةً وَيَخْلُقُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Very interesting. He creates for you the horses and the camels and stuff, so you can ride them. And he, he also creates some other things, other writings, and you don't, know, you don't know about them. It's clear that the Qur'an and Sunnah have a view of the modern world. It's very clear to me. In a way which no other religion, no other prophecy or prophet, someone who claims to know the future in that sense, has ever had. In a very, very specific manner. And therefore, when you see all this, and then the prescriptions of the Qur'an, which to us in the modern world may be counterintuitive. Like for example, cutting the hand of the thief is uh, barbaric. People will say it's repugnant. I mean, uh, what is this? I mean, punitive laws. I mean, don't you believe in stoning and these kind of things? I mean, what, what is this? I mean, we always have to answer these questions, right? Repugnance and barbarism and all, you Muslims are backwards. Yes, uh, we will openly admit there are things in the Quran which are stern, staunch, deterrence. Yes. وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقِصَاسِ حَيَا Interesting, beautiful. Uh, one verse, five ayahs, uh, five words in the verse which tell you the whole reasoning behind the whole thing. In punitive laws, you have haya, meaning this saves lives. I know this, you might not like this, it's a deterrent and it saves life. Simple as this. I don't need to go into details. Believe me, in South Africa, with all the robberies and stuff, if, if this guy knew that, it would come out. And <laughs> his hand going to get cut off. You think he's going to do? He's not going to do nothing. Trust me. So what I'm saying is, the laws and the purity, it might say, it seem counterintuitive. It may even seem false to some people because of their moral proclivities. But the reason why it seems false is not because there is some empirical, methodological, calculated, objective truth from a scientific perspective that they have written out for. The reason why it actually seems false to us is because we're still in an apartheid system. This is very provocative. How can you come to Cape Town University and say that? In 1994, we released ourselves from the shackles of apartheid. How dare you say that? No, we are. But it's, no, it's not maybe a military apartheid or a political one, but it is an ideological one. It's an ideological, and that is a more pernicious one. Because that one, is, you can't see the gates of it. Yes, you can't see the gates of that one. You have a hegemonic American empire, backed by the West all of which are espousing one dominant ideology, liberalism, and under which you have so many subgroups, liberal feminism, liberal this, liberal that, LGBTQ liberalism. All of these things which relate to liberalism one way or another, if we oppose those ideas which come from the top, which are propped up by Netflix on Hollywood, and all those things that you watch, I don't know what the South African alternatives of those things. What's the, you guys have Hollywood alternative? What's it called? Huh? Shollywood? <laughs> 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 
in, in Nigeria, it's Nollywood. You know. But I don't know what it's called here, but whatever they've got here. I heard that Oprah Winfrey is funding this university, trying to control the narrative. That's what I've heard. I don't know if she's... Why, why South Africa, you know? I didn't think that she was from South Africa. Maybe because of Nelson Mandela and all these kind of things. Anyway, I don't know why. But the, the, the point is this. Is the point is there's a new kind of intellectual apartheid. Where we're still expected to listen to the white man without proof. That's effectively what's happening. Yes, you have to listen to the white man. Why is this LG? Why do you have to believe in homosexual rights in these ways, in these particular parameters? Because this white man in this uh, Ivy League university said so. And they all, oh, liberalism was based on white people. I mean, the, in fact, it was white men. It's, there's no women in there. Who started liberalism in the very early days? John Locke and John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham and Rousseau and these kind of. Uh, uh, very few women in there, in fact, of the founding fathers. Of, it's not founding mothers of liberalism. The point is, that's where you find the contradiction. Most of the questions that are asked about Islam have an assumption, a presupposition, which is liberalistic in nature. Once you identify that and realize there's a power structure connected to that, then you start to liberate yourself from the intellectual apartheid, from the colonization, the intellectual colonization. That's why things like this seem odd. That's why things like this seem odd. Now, it's very interesting because the Quran actually offers a challenge. And the challenge is, قُلْ فَأْتُوا بِكِتَابٍ هُوَ أَهْدَى مِنْهُمَا أَتَّبِعُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Bring a book that is better in guidance than the Quran and the Torah, for example, and I will follow it. In other words, the Quran claims to be the best guidance for mankind based on the perfect knowledge and wisdom of God, which has already been demonstrated through what? Through the predictive power of the Prophet Muhammad a thousand four hundred years ago. In such a way that diagnoses the modern state of affairs in a way that nothing or no other religion has. Look at the Bible, for example. I know there's some Christians here. Hello to you. And we, we like, you know, Christians, uh, or friends and all that kind of stuff. But you have to be, speak the truth. In the book of Mark, chapter 13, verse 26, you'll find it says that the universe will pass away in one generation. That is, this, that is an embarrassing verse. So much so that C.S. Lewis himself, seen as the greatest Christian scholar in the 20th century, he called this the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. Because it talks about the future and it got it all wrong. First hurdle. Nostradamus, who is meant to be this great pr prophet of prediction, he said in the year 1505, in 177 years, there will be war and famine and these kinds of things. Nothing of the sort happened. In fact, the opposite happened. There was the Industrial Revolution, the Scientific Revolution, and with prosperity. The opposite happened. So when we talk about prophetic power of prediction and diagnostic of the modern era, this is no joke. We can trust the authority of the text because we've been given the reassurance through things like the signs of the Day of Judgment, the predictions of the Prophet, the Ashrat of the Sa'a, the small signs of the hour, and so on and so forth. They're there to increase our Iman, to reassure us that in fact, the diagnostic is in line with the prescription. This is the power of the Quranic guidance. This is why the Quran is the final and last book that we should be following. There's another argument to be made, which is the following. And I don't want to make this too long because I do want to engage with you guys here in Cape Town. The other argument is, a lot of these claimants, competitors to Islam, effectively, moral competitors, have shown to be false through consequences. For example, let's say for instance, let's take something like, let me be, let me be, let me be provocative today, the act of homosexuality, the act of it, not the, the feeling of it, the act of it be provocative, oh, I know. I'm not here. I mean, in England, if I said this already, the people would be coming down to take me out of the place. <laughs> so uh, since I'm in South Africa, I'm going to take my freedom. Yeah. Am I? <laughs> this is a freedom country, huh? 
Yeah, let's hope so. Let's hope I don't get shot or something. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, <laughs> no, no. Let's take this act. So this is what, from a liberal standpoint, you could say. Homosexuality is okay because why? You can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anybody else. Homosexuality, you're not harming anybody. This is the most common argument you're going to get. This is my response. My response is, okay, fine. First and foremost, I'll say, interesting, you don't include incest. Because a brother and a sister, yani, they can, sorry to say, use condoms and not harm anyone else. Why, do you, why is it not LGBTQI? <laughs> is it because the brothers and sisters didn't hold hands in the streets and, and chant for their rights? Are you waiting for them to do that? Maybe they're embarrassed. Why don't you save them the embarrassment and put them in your alphabet? Huh? It's the same exact understanding of brother and sister can come and have sex with each other, use a condom. You say, deformed baby. Deformed baby, you don't need a baby if you use a condom. The man can get a vasectomy. I mean, Yanni, you can, you can, these are mitigatables, we would call them. But for the sake of argument, I mean, this is not even my argument. I'm saying you're saying you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. Who says you're not harming anyone else? Because as a homosexual, you're 15 times more likely to carry STDs. And if you are 15 times more likely to carry STDs, you're 15 more, times more likely to infect somebody else. So are you harming anyone else or not? And in fact, as a homosexual, if you start a family as a homosexual, you're more likely to have delinquent children, according to all psychological studies that are done on this issue, with pathological psychological traits. You're more likely to have children who under-attain in certain spheres. There's no advantage you're giving a child by giving them two genders parents. In fact, there's an interesting study that shows that two lesbians together, two women together, when they are in a relationship like that, domestic violence is very high like that. Why? Because when you have two women together, the power is almost the same. You see? Like, I've, you know, I'm married, you know, for 11 years. Me and my wife have had our fair share of problems. But I've never seen the day when she tried to... I mean, I'm a big man, it's true. Well, when she's angry enough, she doesn't stand up and say, you know what? She's tried all kinds of methods, but that's not one of them. Because there's a physical balance of power, which is being disrupted here. There's a hierarchy in place. She can shout at me, she can do this, she can that. She goes to her parents, she goes, oh, no problem. I, you can do what you want. But put your hands on me is something which, what, are you trying to massage me or what are you trying to do? <laughs> is this leading up to something which is illicit? <laughs> Have you changed your preferences? <laughs> so sorry to say. But when there's two women, imagine this as like, you know, you've got two equal strengths or similar, the bantamweight division in the, in the UFC. <laughs> but you don't have the referee to break it up. So she's pulling her hair and she's pulling his hair. Who's going to stop it? They're both in bloodbath. The neighbors are thinking they're having a wild time in there, those two lesbians, aren't they? <laughs> Get off me! No, this and that! Leave them, leave them. It's LGBT rights. <laughs> if you get involved, they'll say this and they'll say that and the other. And tell me one thing, I mean, how can you replace breast milk anyway? And now I saw an ugly picture on Twitter, which I wish my memory would remove, of a man with a fake breast, and the child is drinking from it. Now tell me one thing, how is formula milk ever going to replace breast milk? When we know scientifically, I mean, in the UK, they give you uh, incentives to give the breast milk to the child. So what's the point of putting it in the, in the formula, in the, in the thing, and doing this to the child? You're giving them disadvantage. There's too many disadvantages of being in a family of homosexuality. You're telling you, you can do whatever you want so long as you don't harm anyone else. Give them STDs, give them delinquency, give them this, it's not harming anyone else. Even from your own paradigm, it's wrong. On a consequentialist, utilitarian, liberal paradigm, homosexuality is incorrect. I can make the claim. There's another way of reasoning, which is called deontological ethics. They'll say, okay, well, this is a big word, what does it mean? There's a guy called Kant, Immanuel Kant, okay, and he said, look, if something, if you universalize it, it becomes wrong. So he says, for example, if you lie, it's wrong to lie in all situations, because if everyone lies, the, the society will not function, yes? He says, if you break promises, if everyone breaks promises, society will not function. Interestingly, he said, if you don't fulfill your potential, he says, I like this one, it's, if everyone doesn't fulfill their potential, there will not be innovation. And, so you shouldn't do this. But if the idea is if everyone does something, 
He called this the categorical imperative. You can check this up. This it's is a big part of the liberal tradition. You've got, effectively, consequentialism or deontological ethics. That's all you've got. Virtue ethics is not really prescriptive like that. There's the only two ways you can argue from a non-religious perspective that something is, in, is correct or incorrect, from their perspective, really. So I'm saying, OK, look, as a liberal, we've already shown you consequentially, from a utilitarian perspective, that you're wrong as a homosexual, or that you're, the, the act of homosexuality perpetuated is incorrect. But now I'm showing you from a deontological way, which is Kant's theory, which is that if everyone does it, well, if everyone was gay, you wouldn't have the continuation of human race. Isn't that a simple argument? I mean, if you really want to take it there. So in other words, if on all your paradigms, it's wrong, sorry to say. I'm not even bringing Quran and telling you, even though I've got a right to do that. Yani, the Quran says it's wrong, the Bible says it's wrong, the Bhagavad Gita probably says that, I haven't seen. And even if it doesn't, it really doesn't matter to me anyways. And in the West, it doesn't matter because it's not, I mean, but anyway, the Bhagavad Gita. And these ones and that one. And even on your own morality, it's incorrect. So why are you telling me that if you don't believe in these rights and if you don't believe in this kind of homosexuality and sexual practice, that I'm wrong? When you can't even prove to me why it's right in the first place, on your morality, I'm giving you one example. But these are the kinds of examples that we need to flesh out and respond to in kind. So that's when you disturb the social order, the order, the fitri order, the innate disposition order, which God told us exactly yani, what to do, what every single person should do based on their role in society. What the child, what the senior, what the man, what the woman, what this, what that, the mother, the father, all the rights have been perfectly proportioned. You see, when that has been disturbed and you try and, put and transpose another system onto this, then you get dysfunctional societies. It's tempting to think the West is right. It's tempting to think, let me say, white is right. It's very tempting. You know why? Because look what they're doing. For the last hundred years, they've dominated the world militarily and economically and scientifically. But that's not necessarily a logical argument. Just because you've got more money doesn't mean you're right. I know it's, it seems easy to say this, but that's the fact. Just because you've got more money it doesn't mean you're right. It's not an argument for why someone is correct. Like Carl Jung said, Carl Jung was an interesting psychoanalyst. He said, the West are moral, they are technological giants, but they are moral dwarfs. You see, they are moral dwarfs. So it's, it's interesting that they are coming to us with sanctimony and condescen condescension. Why should we accept this? So what I'm saying is the Muslims need to, this is the new, I would call this actually the new revolution. The new intellectual revolution against the intellectual apartheid, which is the bigger one and the stronger one. Because it's not all about, okay, the rights and responsibilities in the political sphere. You have to understand that your most precious asset is your mind and your thoughts and your beliefs. That's your most precious thing. If someone can encroach and control that, then they are changing your very personality. I would rather be put at the end of a knife or a sword or a gun than have my thoughts changed from within. I would rather the enemy that points a gun, but I know his intention, than the enemy who in a micro way comes into me and infiltrates me in that way. So this is your new struggle, ladies and gentlemen. The new struggle, the new intellectual revolution against colonial apartheid, intellectual apartheid, ideological apartheid, colonialization. And obviously, we're not implicating every white person here. We all know that. The Prophet told us. He is the one who told us, La fadla, there's no virtue of a black man over a white man or a white man or a black man. Well, it took them, it's only 30 years ago they found out this in this country. <laughs> it's a laughing stock, actually. I found out there's a place here called Table Mountain. I was astounded. They call it Table Mountain. I said, why? I said, it looks like a table. And the, I thought the guy was joking. I said, shut up, man. <laughs> and then I looked, at, I looked into Google and I found out there's a place called False Bay. Have you heard of this? False, False Bay. That's where they need to take their ideas. <laughs> Say, come here, let me go False Bay. That's where your ideas belong. 
The point I'm making to you, ladies and gentlemen, because I do want to open it up, is that you are the future, honestly. This age group, if this, we, are, we have an opportunity. Seneca said the following. Yes, Seneca, Stoic philosopher. He said, success is when preparation meets opportunity. You have the opportunity here today. But all of you and all of us must be prepared. Prepared for the new mission, which is an intellectual one. We need to have self-confidence in our religion, the true religion from God. And then we need to disseminate that to our people here today. Inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. And we'll open it up to questions and answers. You can just put your hands up and ask the questions, no problem at all. Don't be shy. Huh? Yes, sir. Excellent, brother. How are you doing? Good to see you again. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Mm. And from whom George Soros opened his or started his Open Society Foundation, which, by the way, has been in South Africa since 1993. Really? And he spent over a billion rand wow. on pushing uh, policy change yes. within government, within the Justice Department. The same Karl Popper that was a ph philosophy professor in LSE in England and died in 1994. So Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, do you think that we've come to an impasse now? That yeah. We actually can't go any further because Karl Popper speaks about the tolerance paradox. That you cannot have an open, tolerant society where anything and everything goes unless you become intolerant of the intolerant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting, very good. I think that's a point. I think rather than a question, I think you're making a good point. I put it in a different way. I mean, that, that is a good analysis. I think that we're coming to a point now where the tolerance thing is becoming so outrageous. I'll, I'll give you an example of this. I have a friend of mine called William, and um, he is a, a teacher in a school in Britain. Okay? And you know, we have transgender ideology has become widespread now in Britain. I'm not sure how it is here in North South Africa, but it has, someone has to be identified as whatever they like to be identified as. And we have like, schools which are Muslim majority students, right? And they are forcing that upon the teachers. I mean, I used to be a teacher some time ago in a school, secondary school, high school, basically, you know, in England. So we said, how do we beat them in this? I said, look, do the following. He said, get the students to change their pronouns every day. I said, what do you mean by that? He said, look, you've got 30 students in a class. Get the students to say, send an email to the teacher and say, call me they, call me he, call me she, call me... Whatever, Z, yeah? Call me they. Like, keep changing it. And there's going to be a lose lose situation. How so? Either the teacher's going to get it wrong, in which case it can be reprimanded, and the, and the, and the kid can take a, make an appeal on him, or he'll get it right, but the teacher will get frustrated and exhausted. The point I'm making is, practic even on a pragmatic level, if this reaches a certain level, it won't be operational. That's one point. Pragmatically, it's not going to work. Number two, which is interesting, is that this actually fits in line with Ibn Khaldun's theory. Ibn Khaldun was a great you know, sociologist, and he said that there's a rise and fall of empire. And he said, by the fourth generation, subhanAllah, he's a very clever man. By the fourth generation of an empire which basically takes over, they get so lazy and they have basically a lot of free time because they are no longer... They don't have the military spirit of the first peoples or the second peoples or their children. So then they start doing, buying things, consumerism, doing this and doing that, and that's where the decline of their civilization is. What we're witnessing, really and true, if we're being honest, is the fall of the Western Empire. And it's happening at a very rapid rate. I, I look at the world sometimes and I think to myself, how on earth is this empire going to be overtaken? How is a country like America which spends 13 times more than the next 10 countries combined in military spending with more nuclear warheads than some countries have tanks. How is a country like this going to be defeated? And my conclusion is, it's unlikely going to be from the Chinese or the Russians or the Muslim world. It's most likely going to be from within. So from one perspective, the LGBTQ community 
actually is the very, or the transgender ideology and this hyperliberalism is the worst enemy of the West itself. If, if, you had to, if I was a betting man, and you say, look, what's going to break the Western civilization? I'd say, this ideology. I was looking at a video, the Russian military and the American military. And the American military video, it started with the woman, she was talking about LGBT, and she was talking about this, and she was talking about that. This is a military video, it's talking about the American army. I was, it was a lesbian woman, she was saying, and had the rainbow and this and that. I thought I was watching a Disney film. <laughs> and they juxtaposed this with the Russian one. The guys who had the guns and this and that. I'm thinking, my, my God. They're destroying their own enemies. It's like in the, in the Quran, it says, They're destroying their own homes with their, house, with their hands. It's like you've got a massive palace, huge empire. You get, you, you're sitting in that palace all day now, you don't know what to do with it. So, you know, you, you look at your friend and you say, you know, get the hammer out, get the hammer, forget this, man, this is getting boring. And you start smashing your own furniture and you start smashing the TV and you start hitting your friend as well. And <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, so, from one perspective, the West is eating itself alive with this ideology. But from another perspective, it's, it's the same thing as what happens with all civilizations. It just so happens, if we look at America, like America itself, it's only really been a sole superpower for, for 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the Cold War, 30 years. And it's deteriorating at a rate which no other empire ever deteriorated at that rate, if you really think about it. Because, let, let's say, for example, the Muslim empires. There's been so many countries in the Muslim, so many empires in this Islamic history. They've either been one of the superpowers or the superpower. And it's spanned for like 1,300 years because they've had, the, they had jihad, they had this one, masculinity, gender roles, everything was in place. These guys have destroyed all of that in 30 years. It's a crazy uh, expedition of civilization. And it's due to lack of faith, lack of purpose of life, destruction of family structures, and all the things which the Quran warns against. And so just, just watch and see. It's already been destroyed. I mean, they've got big houses, but they've got uh, empty souls. Do you know what I mean? So the, most of the societies are on antidepressants on a level that's never been precedented in human history. And Schopenhauer said this, it says that society will oscillate between great fear and great boredom, basically. If you're not scared of doing something and nervous about it, then and you're just sitting around, you're going to be so bored. Then when you're bored, you create a problem for yourself. They've created a problem for themselves. We don't have to take that problem on board. We've got enough problems as the Muslims here today. We don't need to take that new problem on board. It's not going to solve anything of ours. The transgender issue, for example, how many people want to re return back to what they were? There's a, there's a book, a very famous book, it's called, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, Regret or, by Abdigail, what's, what's the name? What's, if anyone remembers the name of this book, very famous. It's, it's, it's about like, you know, how they regret something. It's, they call it trans regret or something like that. I can't, the, the, the woman's called Abdigail something, I cannot remember her name. But it's about trans regret and she talks about all this kind of like, how do these many people regret? Because when they do that operation, I mean, imagine taking off your genitalia, like, Imagine doing that, like, that is for me, so I'd rather die. I, I'm telling you the truth. If, so, wallahi, billah. If, someone, <laughs> if someone said, listen, you've got an option. Either I'm going to cut your genitalia off or we'll kill you. I'll send a letter to my family and say, I'm going to die. No chance. I won't live like that. They, I don't know how a person comes to the point where they say, yeah, I want to do this themselves. And imagine now, you have armies filled with people like this. It's unbelievable because that means you're going to reduce your testosterone production, you're going to become weaker, you're going to be the... Unbelievable. If, if I had a fight with someone tomorrow in a boxing match or MMA fight, and it was a big fight in front of so many people, and so, he says, listen, your opponent has taken off his genitalia. <laughs> So, <laughs> I say, well, what do you do? You say that again? I'll be celebrating. I would say, this is going to be the easiest fight of my life. Now you have a group of people, 2%, 5%, whatever it may be, it might grow, and the opponents are taken off the genitalia. And they think they're going to be militarily competitive with the Russians and the Chinese. Chinese is like three on one. You have no genitalia, and there's one here, one there, one there. <laughs> What 
what are you going to do about this situation? So just to answer your question, I think, <laughs> I think honestly, I think that you're right. I think it's critical mass and it's, it's a self-explosion what's going to happen. Uh, in, and I think uh, the way you put it is very, very nice. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Actually, let's, let's, take, one from, let's take one from the sisters. I haven't done this in a while. Does anyone from the sisters want to ask, answer a, ask a question? Huh? See, I'm, I'm, I'm being fair. I mean, I'm a, should I go here and maybe think about it some more? Yeah. If you want to write something down. You got one there? Yes. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? It's not obvious. It's never obvious. <laughs> Go on. Really? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Say that again so my wife can hear it. <laughs> <laughs> because she has the exact opposite reaction. Whenever I come in, it's like... <sighs> <laughs> when are you leaving again to your mom's house? <laughs> Go on. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. So, um, it's been trending lately about um, Muhammad's marriage with Aisha. Yeah. Okay. That she married Aisha, he married Aisha when uh, she was six, and then the marriage was consummated when she was married. Mm -hmm. I've talked to my Muslim friends about this. I feel like I haven't gotten a good answer. You know? Well, no problem. I mean, let me try and give you one, right? As a Christian, you should know that the book of Numbers, chapter 31, okay? does mention, okay, that take the young girls for yourself. Now, when you look at 31.18 in particular, chapter 31, verse 18, the first thing I would say is, let's take a look at that verse. What is it saying? Take the young girls for yourself. When I looked at what this means in the Hebrew, I wanted to know what it means. So I, the word was taf in the Hebrew. They also have a ta, and they also have a fa. The Hebrew language is similar to the Arabic language, yes? Both Semitic languages. And so I wanted to know what does this mean? I went to the Talmud, I went to the different translations, and it means a prepubescent girl. So it's effectively, look, it's, this is what it's saying. The Bible is saying, when Moses comes in and destroys the nation, you can take the young girls, the prepubescent ones, the ones who have not gone through puberty yet, as slaves. Now this is how it was understood for thousands of years. Now, here's the dilemma that the Christian is faced with. If Jesus is part of the Trinity, he is also the author of the Old Testament. Because the Trinity together is God. And which means if God told us what is in the Old Testament, in particular numbers, is the book of the Torah. It's the first five book of the, New, of the Old Testament. If that is the case, then Jesus is commanding us to take slave girls which are prepubescent. Now we go back to our categorical consequential thing. If Jesus was God, and he's part of the Old Testament, and he's part of the Trinity, which is the author of the Old Testament, and he's telling us to take young girls prepubescent for ourselves, which means either he was wrong, in which case God was wrong, either he was right, in which case there's no complaint to be made from the Christian side about any kind of young marriage, or he was neither right nor wrong, which is a contradiction. So which is it, sister? Was he right or was he wrong? I've never seen that, so I'm going to look back. Okay, would you reject the Bible because of this verse? I don't think you're right in the interpretation of the verse. No, no problem. Let's go to the Bible. Who has got a script? Anyone who has a Bible, we can read it together. You can read it in Hebrew. It's there, I promise you. John Calvin believes in that. Let me, let me give you some references. The Babylonian Talmud, okay, there's two kinds of Talmud. There's the Jerusalem Talmud and there's the Babylonian Talmud, right? And the Babylonian Talmud was an interpretive mechanism through which Christian, sorry, Jewish people for hundreds, if not thousands of years were interpreting their own scriptures using their own language. And it says very clearly this means prepubescent girls in the Babylonian Talmud. Very, very, very clearly. And it's been translated into English. And if you want to uh, see it in the... It's there. I mean, you can... I've said, the, I've said the verse number. I've said the chapter number. It's all there. If you want to check it out, you can go to safardia.com because they've actually translated all of the, the Old Testament texts into English. Now, as I'm saying that to you, look. 
Let me ask you a question. If this was in the Bible, as it is what I say, would you reject the Bible? No, let's say it's not. But if it's not a misinterpretation, let's say if it's true, would you reject the Bible? I would reject that because you would reject it. No, okay, fantastic. So you, you reject the, that verse of the Bible? No, I reject That's morally wrong. Okay, but would you reject the Bible because of it? Because if, if you think about it, you've got a verse in the Bible which says something like this. You, if you reject this, you reject the entire Bible because you cannot pick and choose what you accept from the Bible. So I don't mind. If you, if you reject it, then you reject the Bible, in which case we can move on to the Quran and the Sunnah because then you would have left Christianity. So just tell me, are you rejecting this or...? <laughs> Are you rejecting this or are you accepting this? I'm not rejecting the Bible. Why? Okay, but how do you know it's a misinterpretation when you haven't read it? I'm going to go check it now. Okay, check it now. I'll give you 10 minutes and we'll come back to you, okay? <laughs> Use all your, all your resources. Call a friend, ask the audience. I don't know if you had who wants to be a millionaire. Yes, sir. How are you, my friend? Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Not bad. Even better now that I've seen you. Sorry? Even better now that I've seen you. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Shukran so much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, reference to your discussion on the source and for good. Yes. Um, in Michel Foucault's Discipline and Punishment. Yeah. He talks about, uh, he talks about France and the history of punishment, right? Yeah. And he says we've gone from corporal punishment to incarceration. Okay, yes. And he says that this shift is a shift from the punishment on the body mm -hmm. to the punishment of the soul. Okay. And so he makes the argument that this is a form of dehumanization. Mm -hmm. Right? And he says that this shift wasn't because of compassion and mercy, yeah. but because of the instruments of the bureaucratic state, the one okay. to homogenize punishment. Yes. Right? And so let's say, appropriating Foucault, what is the scope for us to reconceive? a teleology of punishment, particularly within the context of an Anglo-American secularism or South Africa, or would the other alternative perhaps be to look at, Gaurik uh, Ramadan talks about a moratorium on Hudud. So what is the scope for the discussion of Hudud and Hudud? I think the entire, first of all, Foucault was one of the founding, you know, postmodernists. And he had a very specific theory on power, which needs to be understood. I mean, his, he believed f power was more like a fog. He didn't believe in the classical, I mean, the classical definitions of what power is, Robert Dahl says is that A's, A's ability to get B to do what A would otherwise not do, for example. He had a different idea of what power is, which is that it's not centered and that it's, uh, it's, it's all dispersed and these kind of things. Now, really, we don't believe in this thing. We cannot, the Islamic conception, is at odds with postmodernist con conceptions, frankly. And in fact, postmodernist conceptions would attempt to unpack, if you like, the Islamic conceptions. It's a meta narrative. Postmodernism's project is to try and undo meta narratives. And Islam is a meta narrative. So they'll say, look, Islam is a meta narrative. We need to, we believe in the hereafter, we believe in this, we believe in that. That's not something really concurrent with the postmodernist project in that, ma in that way. So I wouldn't try and, as you mentioned, appropriate Foucault, if you like. Even though he might say things in Discipline and Punish, which may be uh, in line with our thinking. Yeah, I'm not, not denying that. Even Edward Said, who wrote Orientalism, he, in the beginning of his book, he mentions he's going to use three frameworks, and one of them was the postmodernist framework. If you read the book, he makes a very many valid, valid points. So I'm not saying everything they're saying is false. I'm not saying the structure doesn't give us anything interesting. But I'm saying that I'd be careful in appropriating, as you've mentioned, these kinds of thinkers. As for the auditorium on like hudud and stuff like that, we don't have an Islamic state to really speak of. This is, this is all in the context of an Islamic state. I mean, every country has its own context and its own scholars. We don't need a European like Tariq Ramadan or like myself, effectively born and raised in the West, to go and tell people in different countries what to do. That's another form of problematic uh, power play. Why should we? I mean, uh, people in Pakistan can do what they want. I mean, even if on a democratic reasoning, consider the following, right? Democracy, if everybody in South Africa said, we should have hand cutting. Everyone said the thief, we've, we've got now an epidemic of hand, uh, th theft. We've got an epidemic of theft. What we need to do 
is we need to have very stern and staunch laws against those armed robbers. We should cut their hands. We should do what they're doing in Saudi Arabia and what they're doing in the UAE effectively because it works. You can walk in the UAE with whatever watch you want and whatever car you can drive. At least that's not a problem in the UAE. There are other problems, I'll tell you that. But that's not one of them. So the, the system of the UAE or Saudi Arabia or the Khalij in general of a staunch punishment for, cutting, for stealing is more effective than whatever's happening in South Africa. No one can deny. If someone denies it and says, well, I, no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry to say, Yanni, this, I'm not going to go for it. Which means what? If now the South African government, uh, which I don't want to speak about any, I don't know what their, their powers are in this country. <laughs> South African government. If they decide to go for a certain level of punishment, and they say, we'll do a referendum and say, okay, like, what should we do with the hand cutter? What should we do with the thief? And 99% of the adult voting population says we should cut their hand then now it has a democratic impetus. The liberal may say, well, that's against human rights. But then you at least have a contradiction between liberalism and human rights. Which means liberal democracies are not always one-way traffic. They don't always con concur with each other. The point I'm making is, is that the discussion about hudud, and what should we do, we can even use it in their frameworks and show them the ridiculousness of the discussion. Because it's like hudud is not incommensurate. It's not at odds, incongruent with democracy. It's not even, and I argue this in a small book that I've written called The Liberal Treatise on Ridda, it's, I would argue, not even really against liberalism on a social contract reasoning. But that's a long discussion. I don't want to, if you want to read the book, you can. But the point is, is that hudud is just stern punishments on those who commit crimes. Peter Moskos, who's not even a Muslim, he wrote a small book called In Defense of Flogging. In defense of flogging, yeah, flogging, whipping the person. Yani, why is it in defense of flogging? Because he says that it's a waste of taxpayers' money. He's using consequentialist argument. He said, why should you put someone in prison? The taxpayer has to pay $50,000 a year for this guy so he can be in a prison and get fed and drink and that because he theft, stole something or because he done something bad. When you can whip him in the town uh, center, he get humiliated and he goes back home with his tail under his feet, uh, his legs. This is, he's making the argument from a consequentialist perspective and say, look, it's costing us money to have all these inmates. It's, it's not helping us, therefore we should flog them because it, you don't need to put them in the prison for all this time. So in a way, it kind of goes in line with what you're saying. You know, the idea of a prison in the traditional sense has been exacerbated by the Western uh, world. And uh, Jeremy Bentham actually had this thing called the Panopticon. I'm not sure if you've come across it and this, the new prison and all the kind of things. But the, the, the point I'm making is, that the hudud have a tried and tested record. When you get rid of them, this is what you get. But think about it. You either get punishment from top down, or you get punishment from people who punish each other. It goes back to the dichotomy of, if you have an anarchical system, and if you have complete anarchy, like there's no government, there's no police, there's no military. Imagine a world with zero military. <laughs> no, but it's close. It's cl that's what I'm saying. The more it's close to no military. It's not a zero military, right? It's, uh, it's getting closer. It's not fully. Do you know what I mean? There's some, I'm sure there's some people that are training, doing some stuff. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, but... No, no, look. Okay, let me give you an example. Okay. Mexico, for example, yeah? Mexico, who's in charge? The cartels, right? Okay, what's happening there? People are fighting. People, it's, it's one of the worst, in terms of crime, places in the world to go. In certain areas of Mexico, it's like the crime is so high because there's no top-down punishment. The social contract tells you, look, if you want freedom, if you want security, you have to give up part of your freedom. That's what the social contract effectively tells you. If you want security, you have to give up a part of your freedom. That's the barter that the government makes with the people. If that barter is not made and a social contract is not done, then you have people punishing each other and it's survival of the fittest in a Her Herbert Spencer -in way. Whoever's got the biggest guns and the most money will have the most effect on the people. It's not based on anything. So in this country, for example, you might say like, well, it's top down, it's not as good, it's not as strong. You know, but then, if it's arbitrary, if you've got an authoritarian or dictatorial regime, and it's arbitrary, it's not even, it's all about the person, narcissism, and about the person themselves, that's also problematic, we're not denying that point. But what we're seeing is the opposite in some countries. And so what I'm saying is that the punitive laws are part of a package of stabilizing and securing and deterring criminals. If South Africa put Sharia law, it would be one of the top countries within 20 years. 100%. You would, you would sp these guys that are coming robbing, put your hands up if you know someone who's been robbed.
I rest my case. <laughs> I rest my case. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, my friend. Look, I mean, Muslims are a tolerant people, okay? Anyone who comes into their fold, we have to accept that. Like, Sinead O'Connor recently died. Uh, have you seen Sinead? I felt very bad for her. She was a huge figure in Ireland, Sinead O'Connor. And she came in and she had lots of issues, which I'm not going to mention in respect to her. Lots of issues. And the Muslim community was right not to say anything to her. Men and women, they shouldn't say anything someone like that on the verge. Someone who's come from a very jahili background. We have to offer them wala. And that was a woman who was one of the most, you know, iconic women in all of Ireland, actually. So much so, I even saw Conor McGregor saying, you know, R.I.P. and this and that. I was like, what is he didn't, see, he didn't know that she was a Muslim, right? But the point is, is that I think that if someone comes into the fold of Islam, they should be given some level of allegiance. That's not me saying that. That's really Islam saying that. No doubt about that. If someone comes into the fold, we have to give them some level of allegiance. They are brothers and sisters, 100%. No matter who they are and what they've done. Look, I mean, we sometimes forget our own tradition. You know, there's a, there is a story in the Hadith literature of a man killing 99 people. He killed 99. I don't care what the man's been accused of. He didn't kill 99. 99 people killed them one after the other. And he went to our abbot and he said, oh, will I be forgiven? Will, I, will there be repentance on me? And you know what he said? No. And he killed him again. Looks like he's got the South African mentality. <laughs> From the criminals. Not from all the South Africans, right? <laughs> He's got the apartheid South African mentality, I should say, right? He killed the guy. So anyway, the, what happened is after that, the hadith tells us that Allah basically forgave him at the end of it and that this man shouldn't have said this. The point is, is that you might find someone repugnant. I might find someone repugnant. They become Muslim. It's very difficult sometimes, and I appreciate it. It can be difficult. It can be difficult. Wahshi became Muslim. Wahshi killed and mutilated the Prophet's uncle. Now we don't know for a fact if he ate the liver, and to be honest, that hadith is daif of him eating the liver of Hamza, you know. But he mutilated and he killed the Prophet's uncle, you know. Imagine someone killing your father or beloved uncle. Do you have enough compassion in your heart to accept them as part of your family after that? You might not. The Prophet said, you know, I forgive you, but I can't really bear to communicate with you. So people in this audience will have different tolerances with Andrew Tate. I know that for a fact. On this side, maybe less tolerance, maybe this side more tolerance. <laughs> I'm guessing. And, and by the way, I don't mind that. That's fine. That's natural. They should, I mean, we shouldn't attack women for this. If they really find him like he's, they don't like his personality, Khalas. some women, they don't like his personality. You can't do anything about that. You can't force them to love it like the guy. I know the flip side, but at the same time, do you know what I mean? We have to welcome him to some extent, okay, you might have more reserved attitude, you might say, look, I'm not really into what he's about, but you know, accept he's part of, you know, Islam, that's it. Or you might say, oh, my hero has come to Islam. And then I'll respond, no, your hero has been a Muslim for 31 years. <laughs> I'm, only I'm only kidding, I'm only kidding. But you see what I'm saying? So that's how I would approach it. I think, you know, everyone has, you know, their way of dealing with it. But I'm just saying that we, I personally have... I consider him to be a brother because he's a Muslim brother. If I had been, uh, if I had been, I'll be honest with you, if I had been through some kind of traumatic experience myself, I can empathize with someone who may associate him with that and think I can't really see eye to eye with him. Yes, he's a Muslim brother, but that's, that's what I'm going to say. Yani, there's, there's, there's sunnah for this and there's, sunnah, there's precedent for this and there's precedent for that. Yeah, uh, have I already asked you? Oh, so, okay. Someone here? Who? Who? Him? Okay, okay. Well, everyone's electing you, but you're standing up, mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes. I mean, not engage in it in the first place. I mean, that's the way to do it. Now, the pro as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, the Prophet told us there'll be a time where he actually told us this, you know, it's, it's going to be so widespread that you will not even be able to avoid it. The Quran tells us the answer, Fear Allah as much as you can. 
Now, I don't know your context, and that's actually a question for the ulama. And you have, because, you know, al hukm ala shay' far'a an tasawrihi, as the, uh, the usuli say, that you cannot do actually a hukm on something unless you know the situation. So I don't know anything about uh, the student finance in South Africa, if you have it. In England, we have our own situation. I don't even know about that one, about the England one. I'm, I'm still debating that. So to be honest with you, that's above my pay grade, that one. That requires, you know, a little bit more because it's interest and fiqh and related. So, yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Salam. Yeah. She spoke about the hadith and she asked her Christian friends and they didn't answer. They gave her shoddy answers, you know. And that's a problem that we face here. That there's some questions that we assume to be stupid or to be, you know, low level that we don't look at them. Like for example, Albert Einstein says, if you can't explain something to a six year old, then you don't understand it. You know? So, like for example, I was talking about the preservation of the Quran. You don't know how the Quran was preserved about it, or how they went about preserving it, we just take it and run with it. And such information we should know about. It. To say, if a Christian comes to us and say, how do I know that this book for 1400 years has been preserved and well kept? So my question to you is, how is the Quran being preserved? Okay, thank you for that. But before I come to you, have you got something? <laughs> huh? I think you missed what it is. Tell me the verse. Read it out for me, please. Should I give you a little bit more time? No, say the verse again. No, I, I quoted a part of the verse, which is, and keep the young girls for yourself. Which verse was it? 31.18. Numbers. numbers. Okay. <laughs> All right. Take your time. In the meantime, let me answer this question, because, look, I'll, the reason why I did this with her, can you see what's happening now? Yeah. Who's explaining to who now? Now, with all due respect, you, I don't want to say you fell into my trap. I'm not, not saying that. Uh, yani, she's, she asked a question which everyone knows about Islam, which is, why did the Prophet ma marry a nine-year-old or whatever? That's a question. We've all heard that question before, right? I wanted to test the sincerity of our young lady here. Because if this was a serious problem that was stopping someone from coming into Islam, it would logically follow that if it was in your own religion, you should reject your own religion. Do you see the point? So the reason why I asked you that question young lady, is because I wanted to see if you are going to take the sentiment to its logical extreme. I have a feeling, and I might be wrong, that you may have a missionary agenda. I might be wrong about that. But because I've dealt with so many missionaries before, I have filtration mechanisms. You see, I have filtration, I have tests that I do. Now, there's two things. Justification is for defendants. Just remember that. Justification is for defendants. Now, you only justify a why is this when you need to defend yourself from something. Now, in a sense, I don't need to, and Islam doesn't need to defend itself from anything or anyone. But for me, as a Muslim person, there's, I would do that. I would engage in justification if I felt like the recipient was indeed sincere. So I have to have tests to prove the sincerity of the recipient. Hence why I asked her, if, it was a hypothetical, if this was in your book, would you reject your book? If it was, if it wasn't, she answered in a pretty consistent way. So I'm tempted to give her time of day now, actually. I'm not, not going to lie to you. She said, if it was in my book, I would reject it. She, she did say this. She, um, yani, do you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, do you know what I mean? But I'm saying that for me to engage in just, I've reached a level now in my life with marriage, with life, with family, with dawa that justification becomes exhausting. For me to tell you why, I'm, why are you wearing this? Oh, because I this and that. It, I, I've become exhausted from the situation. I'll be honest, I've become mentally and physically exhausted from the idea of justification. I don't want to justify myself, my being, my religion, myself or anything, unless and only unless that is an absolute requirement. Because justification means I'm on the back foot. Now I will be on the back foot for those who I believe are sincere. But me being on the back foot for an agenda, I cannot do it now. 
Why? Because we've already said there's a power struggle and there's colonialism going on. And it's difficult to know what's happening right now. Do you see what I'm trying to say? So, it's okay. I mean, you can look at it in your own time. I can give you an answer for the question of six to nine in a second. I was just asking you that question to try and prove your authenticity. Just to answer your question first and then come back to you, okay? To answer your question, the Quran has been preserved first and foremost because we have something called the chain of narration. The Islamic religion is the only religion in the world, and I'm making the claim clearly, that has something called a chain of narration. I want to tell you something which I don't think you knew this. Do you know the Torah, which I just quoted, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, all of these books? Do you know when it was actually codified? It was written down. It was written down 1,400 years after Moses. Do you know, let me tell you what that means, just to understand. Right now is the year 2023. Okay? In Islamic calendar, it's 1,445 or something, or 44. Yeah? Now, between me and the Prophet Muhammad is about 18 generations. 18 people, maybe 20. Yes? Me, yani you and me, and then the Prophet Muhammad is about 20 individuals. Okay? That's a lot of, I mean, granddad, 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 yeah, 20 generations. Okay? Now, I don't, yani I don't really know my great, 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 great granddad. I might have a name, but that's all I'm going to have. Imagine if I told you, I know the life of my great-granddad to 20 generations, and I'm writing a book about his life. How authoritative would that book be? It's extremely problematic. Unless I had a clear chain of narration. My granddad told my granddad told my granddad, and he wrote it down. He said this, he said that. And this one corroborated it. There's, there was something going on. There would be no history that I have. The Torah is between the Torah and... The, and us, between Moses and the Torah, is a thousand four hundred years. Yani Moses, yes, and the Torah, between them, they wrote it down for one thousand four. It's between me and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It's the same distance. They have no chain of narration. Their histories are completely taken, yani, as a joke actually by many historians. To be honest with you, with, with all due respect. They don't even respect the, the books of the Bible uh, as historical. The Old Testament, the New Testament is more respected, I'll be honest. But the Old Testament, it was 3,000 years ago. I mean, no, who, who, cares? who wrote that? They have something called docu uh, documentary hypothesis. This hypothesis, who wrote it? It was like, it was a combined effort by lots of people. And Gilgamesh and this one and that one. And we don't know where it came from. Look, the Quran, comp just compare the Quran with the Bible. We have a chain of narration. The oldest book that we have, we have fragments going to the time of the Prophet and yani carbon dated to the time of Muhammad Sallallahu The palimpsest that's in the Turkey is literally one generation after Uthman. What are we talking about here? And Uthman is the one who wrote it and we all know. Yani Uthman was the friend of the Prophet he married his daughters. That's how we've written, that we're talking about written. Let alone the chain of narration, let alone the Arabic, let alone the memorization of the millions of... Look, let me tell you something, yeah? This is a fact. No one can deny it. The most memorized book of a huge size is the Quran. Of that size. It's the most memorized book of a size of its book. There's no doubt about it. There's no one who's memorized the Bible. I've never met a person who's memorized the Bible word for word. I've never met them. In this very Cape Town, you'll find at least, I don't know, at least maybe 3,000 people. Memorization of Quran, memorization, this one. The young one, the big one, that, that one. The old man, the young man. You don't have to go to, if you, I want to I find, if I put on YouTube, on Google, I want to find someone who's memorized the entire Bible, I want to test them as well. I would have to go to Jerusalem and come here with the camera and the security and this and that, and this guy, old man, and he makes 100 mistakes in the first pages. How can anyone compare the preservations? No chance, I'm sorry to say. In the world, how many Hufaz do you think there are? Millions. Millions. I memorized the Quran driving the car around. I didn't even, remember, I didn't even go to Tafid school or something like this. I was driving the car there, there, that's not going, and doing every day a little bit, little bit. And one day, oh, I've memorized the entire Quran. It's not even that difficult. We have made the Quran easy to remember, so who is going to remember it? Allah put something inside of it, it makes it easy for the young one to memorize the Quran. 
someone who doesn't even know the word of what they're saying. It's unbelievable. How can we compare? So from a preservation perspective, we can prove that the Quran is preserved using chains of narration, which are so many. There's a book by Ibn al-Jazari called Tabaqatul Qurra in Arabic language. It tells you every single chain at every level to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, going back to Hafs and Shaaba and this one, that, and Asim and then uh, Ibn Abdurrahman al sulami and then Uthman ibn Affan and Ibn Mas'ud. Khalaf Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Finish. We have the chains of what do you want? What, what more do you want? Yani, the, the, the HCM that historians have done a history master's degree in University of London. And they believe in something called the historical, the, the, uh, what do you call it, the HCM, critical method. The HCM, if this was scrutinized at the highest, and it has been, it's, the Quran preservation has been scrutinized by non-believers, atheists, and they say it's been preserved. They, they, of course, there are dissidents and revisionists, but the majority opinion has been preserved. That's not their opinion with the Bible and the, the Old Testament, by the way. So I'm sorry to say, this is not even controversial. For me, it's uncontroversial, Yani. That's why we have Muslims fighting on every issue. I don't know about here in South Africa, in England, there's five, everything. This one raising his hand like that, this one wearing leather socks, this one, that one, this one. Yani, they're fighting about it. They'll, they'll, they'll maybe go to fists for, for fighting. This one praying eight rakahs in the message, this one praying 20. I don't know if you have this issue. Have you got this issue? You don't have it. In not as bad, but there is bad, very bad, and this and that, very... Yani. But let me tell you of one thing Muslims don't disagree on, is the Qur'an. It's unbelievable, isn't it? Is that the truth? Have you ever heard of this one's uh, fighting that one because of the Qur'an? I've never heard that one in my life. But the Bible, oh please. King James one, I mean Ahmad Didat was here some 20 years ago, showing the King James, and uh, having the South Africans learn the lesson? <laughs> of course that one is not preserved. By the admission... Of the Christian scholars, Bruce Metzger, the corruption, he wrote the corruption of the Bible, he wrote the book. I mean, these arguments now have become well known, yes sir. Thank you so much brother. Yes. Our stance with this stuff is like Imam Malik, he looked at the Prophet Asasalam's grave and says, Kullu insan yu'khadu minhu wa illa sahib al qabr. He says, everybody you could take something from them and leave something from them except for the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So everyone is susceptible to falsification, to use Karl Popper in terms. Karl Popper said that. Falsification method. Everyone, everyone's words can be falsified. Except for we believe the Quran Sunnah because we believe that's from God and He's all-knowing and all-wise. Simple as that. So we should have, I mean, don't be too hasty to ally yourself with the left or the right or anybody. I mean, if you look at the civil rights movement in America, what made it successful, it was pretty insulated. Like they didn't really seek help. I mean, of course, there was a difference in approach between Malcolm X and uh, Martin Luther King. And of course, Nelson Mandela had alliances with different people and so on. But at the core, we have a cause ourselves. Our cause is the intellectual liberation of the Muslim project. That is what it is, from liberal ideas, from uh, neo-feminist ideas, from transgender ideology, from LGBT ideology, from any neo-colonial ideology that comes from the Western production hemisphere. That's our project, our removal of that. And anyone who wants to you know, be our friend or respect us, we'll respect them in kind, no problem. So are, in other words, we shouldn't be too dismissive, but we shouldn't be too accepting as well. I mean, it's very straightforward, like, you know, because it's not, it doesn't, it's not even a good look to grovel and to beg. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-yad al-ulya khayrum in the yad al-sufla. Yani, the upper hand is better than the lower hand. You're asking for people so, all the time, khas, you become a beggar. We don't want the Muslim community to become a beggar to the right wing or to the left wing in South Africa or in any part of the world. Why do we need that? We've had that already. We've had that and it was a failed project and it was a humiliating thing. We need to, we need to re-establish and reaffirm and reassert ourselves. That's what we really need. So yes, I think that's um, to answer your question. Just take some and leave some. Uh, any from this side? Yes. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. 
Amen. Thank you so much. Um, so, in South Africa, especially in townships, there's a huge stumbling block when doing Dawah, which is that Islam has a faith, and that faith doesn't accommodate uh, black people, mm. see. So it's a myth and it exists. Now, I wanted to ask you, what is it that we as a youth can do in order to dispel that myth and to show sort of those who have that misconception that that is actually not true, it's not the depiction of Islam? Yeah, it, well, first of all, what you said is correct. I mean, like, if you consider what the demographic heartland of Islam is, it's not Arabia and it's not Pakistan, it's actually Indonesia and Malaysia. I mean, if you look at statistically where the most Muslims in the world are, number one country is Indonesia. Number two is maybe Pakistan, I think, is on the list. But if you add the Indian Muslims, then maybe they'll know, I don't know if they're number two or number three, but then you have Nigeria is one of the top, even though it's half of the population is Christian. Africa itself, I mean, look at the countries now. Malawi is next door, 45% of the population are Muslim, you know, and it's increasing. And there's a lot of dawah opportunities in Malawi. But what I'm saying to you is, statistically, Islam is a very cosmopolitan religion. It has every kind of people. It has black people, it has uh, Asian people from this side. Uh, by the way, I don't, you guys have very specific like, terms, colored and stuff like that. When you say colored in America, it means a black man. Or, or a brown man, maybe, or something. It doesn't, here it means mixed race, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah you see, in England, if you, you can't use that term. Right? England, mixed race, we say half, car, half caste before, now they say mixed race. So we use colored means mixed race in England. I, I met a guy before, he was an Arab guy in, well, in England, and he had the impediment, like he was disfluent in the English language. And he was like, he didn't know what word to use, even in the English context. He was like, yeah, yeah, I've got a friend, and he's a crossbreed. <laughs> I was like, this guy. <laughs> I was like, this guy is not onto it. But the point I'm making is statistically, Islam is very cosmopolitan. And subhanAllah, that's how Allah intended it and how the Prophet intended it. Because it was actually tolerant to all races. It's the only, like, think of this. I don't know of any verse in the Bible. I don't know, I'm taking the Bible too much today. <laughs> and I apologize. We believe in part of the Bible. You know, we, we, we love Jesus, we love Mary, you know. Honestly, and we love Christian people as well to come to Islam and to this and that. We can marry Christians. We can marry them. That, I mean, that's no invitation to anybody. I mean, depends on how long I'm going to stay here in South Africa. I mean, I'm only kidding. But the point is, is, is you know what I mean? We, we, we're open-minded people. But what I'm saying to you is, and what was I just saying now? <laughs> Don't let my wife hear you say that, man. I'll be knocked out. But what I was saying was that you know, Islam is the only religion that I know. The only, the only, yeah? Which clearly says there is no virtue over a black man, over a white man, over an Arab, over an Arab. I dare, it's an open challenge. You can bring all the Christians in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, in Pretoria, and in the whole South Africa. And I've announced this to the world, millions of views online, and let everyone... There's no such verse in the Bible and you'll never find it. Which actually accommodates for all races in this emphatic way. Where the Prophet says there's no virtue of a black man. In fact, you find the opposite in the Bible. And I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what, what, would you, what, what, what did Jesus say? Huh? When <laughs> We don't believe Jesus would do this. So if you say it's immoral, I would agree with you, by the way. Because we love Jesus, by the way, yes? We think he didn't do immoral things. I think his mother was not immoral at all. We're, we're on the same path on that situation. But what I'm saying to you is, what Jesus said is, when the Gentile woman came to him. Do you know this verse? Everyone knows this verse. I, mean, I don't know if you know this verse. And he, referred, he said, I'm not going to. He called her a what? A dog. Gentile means non-Jewish. He, you know, he says, you know, got a, uh, I've only been sent to save the lost sheep of Israel. So he referred to the Gentile woman as a dog. It's unbelievably clear in the Bible. You can check it out. <laughs> it's 100%. He called the Gentile woman dog, animal. We would call that racism. We would, today, Mandela would say, no. <laughs> Whereas in the Quran, it's very clear. So, Racism in Islam is not accepted and Islam is a cosmopolitan religion and Islam is a religion which accepts the black people and not only does it accept it, think historically of the most successful in the last thousand years, black uh, African civilizations. 
Many of them, I don't want to say the majority of them because I'm not an African historian. I cannot say this. But a lot of them, like the Mali Empire, have been Muslim. They have been the most successful, maybe of all time. Mansa Musa, what was he? I didn't think he was a Christian. He wasn't converted by force, Mansa Musa. And he was throwing gold around and they called him the richest man in the world. He had the black face and he was a black man. And he was the most powerful man maybe in the world at that time. Where the Europeans were in the dark ages. Yes? So Islam, whenever it goes into a civilization, it elevates the civilization in a massive manner. Like for example, look at the Arab civilization. I am meant to be an African like you in many ways. I'm from Egypt, but also an Arab. Look at Arabian history before the Prophet Muhammad SAW came. Yani if the Prophet SAW did not come to the Arabs, Arabs would have nothing to offer. I can say this as an Arab. It would have zero to offer. What would they do? Nothing. You know, this and that and fighting over this and camels and all of that. Trust me, that without Islam, the Arabs would have very limited to offer. Islam created an empire for the Arab people. 100% in a manner that nothing else could do. You see? And so whenever Islam enters a people, because it gives you power and izzah. Yes, that's what Islam gives you. There's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet. It says, Sharaf al ummah qiyamahum bil-layl. The dignity of the Muslims is them standing up in the night and praying. Yes? Wa'izzuhum istighna'um an nas. And their dignity is their independence from the people. Going back to your question about right-wing, left-wing allegiance. We have to be insulated. Look at the United States of America. Tell me when the United States of America was most successful. What made it successful in the first place? A policy of insulationism in the 20s and 30s. They said, we don't need the world in the 20s and 30s. They said, we, will, we won't export things in. We'll do it our, ourselves. FDR said, go out and spread into the country. and all, uh, Roosevelt. He said, spread into the country and do this and do that. That's why they actually have a good spread of population in America. 330 million people, but it's spread pretty well actually. Compared to, like, say for example, like Egypt, where you've got 30 million people in one place. It's like one third of the population and the, the, it looks ridiculous. It does look ridiculous. You thought Johannesburg had traffic, go to Cairo, travel up. You'll, you'll come back to Johannesburg and say, well, I'll deal with the knife crime or the gun crime, whatever. The traffic is not, it's too, it's too much. <laughs> you know what I mean? The traffic is unbelievable. But America, they spread that thing very well. Why? Because they had a mentality of self-sufficiency. This is 100 years ago, less than 90 years ago. That's when they did that. And then when they were able to intervene into World War II, they were able to deliver the decisive... Without America, they would have lost England and France and these. They were able to de deliver the decisive blow, and with that decisive blow, they became the... Effectively, one of the, the two, it was called a bipolar system. Them and Russia were the two big powers, and in ninety one they became the champion of military, I'm not, any, any, not moral losers, but military champions. We have to give them. So, uh, so that's what happened. So what I'm saying is that when a community decides to operate within itself and be self-sufficient, produce its own things, its own ideas, its own equipment, that's when the community becomes strong. Their independence from the people, as the Prophet ﷺ told us. Any questions from this side first? Yes. Salam. Thank you very much, you know, that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Candace Owens. Interesting. She just had an interview with Tate, I think she did. I don't, I don't know if I want to have a debate. I mean, she, she said herself, I'm not, she, when she was speak, speaking to Tate, she said, I'm not interested in religion or something. She goes, I'm not a specialist and something like that. I saw a clip. I didn't watch the whole thing. But that, so what would we talk about? There's be, like Annie, Candace Owens would agree with us on many issues, by the way. But on the other hand, she's not really an academic, frankly. And she doesn't have any accolades. So why would I do that? Like, Annie, would she have to come to England? If she came to England... Okay, well, I don't have to travel or anything like that. Maybe it's a possibility. I'm not going to lie to you, but for me to travel for, I wouldn't travel for this. With all due respect to her. Yes. In vaccines. I don't want to talk about them because last time I said something, YouTube took the video down <laughs> and they'll threaten you. But I had an incident. Okay. Yeah, I did, yeah. So I don't want to mention what the incident was. I, after I had the incident, I thought I was in a strong position. I sent the, the company in question, I sent them a letter, an email. 
I said, give me two million. I said, I said if you give me two million dollars, I will not expose you. You know, I tried, I tried my luck, you know, what? Well, <laughs> They sent me a thing back, he said, look, there's something called vaccine damage payment uh, hotline, go, go to that, and I didn't get any money from them. <laughs> but then I realized that if you speak about it online, they can take the entire video down, which I recommend, Yanni, removing it, because they, they've done that before. And they can even take your channel down, your entire channel, YouTube channel, Wallahi, uqsum billah. I've seen it, it's happened, Yanni. So this, this is a topic I don't even talk about publicly, unless maybe we're going to go back there and talk about it, or something. <laughs> huh? Should, should we should be in the... I'm not, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I don't, I'm not a medical professional. Do you know what I mean? I, of, but what I'm telling you is, I had a particular experience, which no one can deny that, you know, I had a particular experience, which I have documentation for it, you know. But anyway, that's, that's a different uh, issue. Yes? Yeah. Is that happening here? In is it? Okay. Really? There's nothing we can do about that, I'm afraid. I've tried my best in England. If I, if I can't fix it there, I mean... I yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I see this. I see this. But, but look, I, I see what you're saying. Look, I see that sometimes, you know, inter-Islamic inter debate can lead to doubts in Islamic. I agree with that. I mean, it can happen. But what I would say is that, do you know what unifies Muslim people? When there's an external enemy which attacks them. Look in the history of the world. That's what happens to nations and peoples. When there's an external enemy that attacks the people, then people come together. And now we have to remind the number one approach to alleviate this from us is to realize that we've got a massive external enemy, okay? And it's trying to take away our freedom of thought and belief. If we exacerbate this naturally, I've seen from experience, these debates become secondary. People realize, okay, Yanni, let me give you a, an extreme example. Extreme example, the Mu'tazila is an extreme, uh, it's, sorry, it's an extinct group of Muslim people. They, there's not really a demographic for them anymore. Well, they had a rich intellectual tradition back in the days. The rationalists or Mu'tazila, well known, yes? Now, those individuals, would you rather have someone, yani, in the case where this is a choice, someone becoming Mu'tazili or becoming atheist, which one's better? Yani, Mu'tazili is still, according to everyone, still a Muslim. Everyone says he's not, la yukafar, he's still a Muslim guy. Being an atheist, yani, do you see what I'm trying to say? For, from our perspective, we need to prioritize, and when you see the bigger enemy, which is outside this enemy, the hegemonic power trying to take our rights away, not just in South Africa, but it's a global thing now, then I think that, that helps. Yes? Okay. Uh, coming back to the topic of atheism, yes. I just want to ask a question from, more from personal experience. Okay. Um, so can you, how would you define faith now? And you're quite in the business of debating and like rational arguments. So would you say this is an effective way to bring people into the faith, aside from just um, you know, defending uh, it? And like for example, William Lane Craig, like he also you know, is debating an yeah. international argument. Yeah. But I heard him on a podcast say that he never expects people to convert because of his argumentation. And it's like, like that settling of faith uh, is something completely different. So my question to you is, what is the most effective thing to set of faith in someone's heart? Do you find that rational argument is effective? I think it's effective, but it's, it depends on the demographic and the socioeconomic class. Yeah. Like, for example, I remember in uh, the most effective thing, uh, this, this is going to sound very bad, but like, when we used to go and do dawah in England, London, yeah. if we go to the poorer areas, people would come in like 10 a day. You go to the rich areas, and it's you'd be very difficult to get one person. Do you know what I mean? It's just whatever the, the cause is, it's just a, so that's one thing. It depends on who you're talking. And these guys don't need all that rational argument. If you tell a normal person, any like with a fitrah which is salima, yeah, which is a pure fitrah, you say to them, listen, God is one, He created the universe. This proposition is acceptable to almost anyone. You know? And so we believe in God, He's one, 
uh, we believe in all the prophets, we believe in Jesus, we believe in Moses, we believe in Abraham. No, we do. We, we believe in them, you know. And we believe in this. Wallahi, you'll be surprised at how many people come into Islam. Just by stating the beliefs, without even going into an argumentation. But the reason, one of the main motivations for me doing this is not just to stop people from having doubts and stuff, which it does help. It does help, I can see for it definitely. But it's also to give, to embolden the Muslim community, to let them know that they have an argument. Because we, just because we don't have a military hegemony right now, it doesn't mean that we, don't, we cannot produce our own knowledge. We are making use of the opportunities that we have to produce our own knowledge because there is a way in which we can strengthen the Islamic civilization, the project of Islamic civilization. So it has more than one function. I think it's important. It's always been there in our tradition. You see, that's one question. So let me go here first. Yep. So I'll come back. Yeah. Five minutes left? Okay. Yes. You're right. The way you said it is a very good way of putting it. That Islam is not a new religion. That we believe, like Allah says very clearly in the Quran, "Ma kana Ibrahim a Yahudiyan, wa la Nasraniyan, wa la kin kana Hanifan Muslimah, wa ma kana mal Mushrikin." That think of Abraham. He wasn't Christian because Christian means follower of Christ. Christ didn't exist at that time, so he couldn't be Christian. He wasn't Jewish because Jewish comes from Judah. Judah is one of the sons of Isaac, and Isaac was one of the sons of Ismail. Uh, it goes back to Ibrahim. Ibrahim is his granddad. So, what I'm saying is, how could Judah, whose granddad was Ibrahim, be a follower? How could Abraham be a follower of Judah, his own grandson? It wouldn't. So both of them came after him. So what was the religion of Abraham? He wasn't. He didn't follow Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam because Muhammad wasn't there. As well, we say he had, he believed in Islamic monotheism. He believed in God, one God, submitting to one God. That's what he believed in. So at his time, we would have said, La ilaha illallah, Ibrahim Rasulullah. At his time. If, it were, if we lived in Jesus' time, we would have said, La ilaha illallah, Isa Rasulullah. At the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we would have said, La ilaha illallah, Rasulullah. Because that's the last and final prophet. So the way you've put it there is excellent. I mean, that's the way to give da'wah. So yes. Uh, let me see someone who I haven't spoken to before. Just uh, uh, my friend here with the suit, yes. The good looking man there in the back, yeah. No, no, sorry, I said the good looking man. I'm joking. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only kidding. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. <laughs> Hello, Salami. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah, 60 cubits. Over 27 meters. Yeah. And they said, until the day of judgment, the generation will get shorter yeah. and shorter. Yeah. So, when we speak, sir, when we speak about 1,400 years ago, mm. so generation was different. Mm. The building of the body was different. Yes. Even we right now, the growing of the goals in African countries is different than Europe countries. True. You see the goal, she grow bigger than the Europe countries. Yes. Even here in Kalisha. Not If someone had to comment on that, yeah. was the enemy of the Prophet on that? Yeah, it's true. But they never ever comment on that. MashaAllah. MashaAllah. They accepted. They doubt about the Quran, they doubt about the Prophet. He is not the Prophet, but they never comment. You should start your own channel, brother. I like this. <laughs> <laughs> He's good, huh? MashaAllah. What part of Egypt are you from? Garbiya, mashallah, they're the best people, you know, as, as we say. <laughs> really, yeah? Oh, you do have one already? Mashallah, fantastic. Yes, you're right. Look, we believe that she was pubescent. And there is a hadith that says Aisha, at that time at nine, she was pubescent. Like she went through puberty. She says it herself, I went through puberty. You know, and so, yeah, yeah. I, I would love to come back to you, but I just... Go ahead, go ahead. Why not? Go ahead. Sorry? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I get you, I get you. So what I would say, look, yep. Yeah. yeah, so, okay. There was, there's, okay. No, excellent, excellent, I got you, I got you. No, I got you. All right, no, but so let me ask you a question, because there's very little time. Just on this point, 
There's two kinds of emulating the Prophet. So like the Prophet might have had, he loved, loved red shoes or something. I'm not saying he did, but I'm just saying I don't have to love red shoes. So for example, the Prophet had nine wives at one time. You know, I'm only allowed four. There are some things which I can, I don't know, I don't know why I mentioned this. <laughs> there are some things which, which, which you can emulate the Prophet for and there's some things which is his preference and some things which is not, it's not ijbari, it's not wajib. So no one says it's wajib for you to marry. For example, the Prophet married non-virgins, except for Aisha. Everyone else was not, she was a divorcee. It doesn't mean now we all have to yani, marry divorcees. So from that perspective, in terms of today, I'll be honest with you, the way to answer this question is, we would, he's right, I mean, before, back in the day, the situation was different. And the, the, the situation is based on circumstances. Islam doesn't actually tell you when, exactly what age, like in the Western countries, it tells you in this country it's 16, this one says 18, this one says 14. Yeah, I mean, one man's Peter, for, for example, in Russia, is 14 years old. So the man marrying a woman, he's fine, he's a good citizen. He, he takes his wife and he goes to America for holiday, he's a pedophile. Do you see what I'm trying to say? It's arbitrary lines. It's basically a social construct. What, we're say, what Islam says is, instead of these arbitrary lines and social constructs, it depends on the person. Which means that the person can be different. So for example, you can have someone who is, develops quicker. Someone who develops, and what is development? It can be psychological, it can be sociological, it can be anything. How do you decide on whether the person is ready or not? Well, you go to their parents, you go to the doctors. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَن تَطَبَّبَ وَلَا يَكُمْ بِالطِّبِّ مَعْرُوفًا فَأَصَابَ نَفْسًا فَهُوَ ضَامِنٌ Whoever tries to be a doctor and he's not really known for being a doctor and he harms somebody, then he's responsible. Which means that Islam actually gives, it gives power to doctors. It gives power to specialists. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ No one is going to, as a society nowadays, the world has changed. I agree with you. But Islam is, it has an inbuilt flexibility. Which means that things change and Islam changes with it to some extent. Which is why Shafi said, إِذَا دَاقَ الْأَمْرُ إِتَّسَعَةِ الشَّرِيعَةِ If the situation becomes more constricted, the sharia becomes more flexible. It's an inbuilt flexibility. Because there's a difference between objective morality and absolute morality. We believe in an objective morality, but not an absolute one. Which means that, this, like for example, I can eat pork in certain situations. If I, if, I eat, if I'm dying and I eat pork, I can drink alcohol. But there are some things that Islam says you can never do. Someone says to you, go and kill this one. Or otherwise I'll kill you. You cannot kill this one. If someone says, rape, sorry to say, yani, rape your daughter, otherwise I'll kill you. You can never rape her. Islam says you can never rape. So I'm saying the point is, there is, if you ask me today, would a nine-year-old, would you allow your nine-year-old, would, I would say no actually. Because the situation has changed so much that a nine-year-old back in 1,400 years ago had the social and psychological responsibility. Some of them were open households. Back in the Greek times, they were fighting with swords. Now we have different sets of psychological and social expectations. So the, the point is, childhood has changed. And it was changed in the 20th century. It changed in the 20th century when the age of consent actually changed in 1929 in England to, for example, the age of 16. Before that, it was 12. In, in, the, in the 1800s in, the, in America, you can marry a seven-year-old in Delaware and other places. So when did it change and why did it change? According to my historical assessment, the reason why it changed is because after World War I, there was a destruction of the infrastructure and in England in particular and Britain, decided to put education as one of the priorities. So they linked the age of adulthood with when you finish education. Do you think there's a, it was a, f a funny coincidence that the age of consent in most countries now is 16? And that's the same age when you finish education? So you became an adult when you finish education, but the scientists don't say that. If you go on Google, when is an adult an adult in psychology? No one says 16. Yani at 15, yani you kill somebody, you're not going to go to court. You know, 15, you're, you're fully developed, you understand that? 14, you're fully developed and this and that. Where do we stop it? Really and truly, traditionally, it has been at puberty or when the body has been developed and the mind has been developed and so on. So it wasn't seen as strange as the man says. That's why his enemies never used it against him. That's why it's mentioned in the Bible. Sorry to say, yeah. But even it's mentioned worse in the Bible. And, and, and what's, what, what the Jewish practices and stuff like that of how they interpret the Bible. But what I'm saying is, there's never been a society that has seen this as a problem until recently. That's a historical fact. This is a problem of a hundred years ago. You'll never find a historical account of people like two, three hundred years ago attacking others for this. Because that's what they used to do. 
And the, the, the deal of that, the evidence is that in most countries in the world, it was legal to marry eight-year-olds and nine-year-olds. It was legal. Delaware was seven-year-olds you can marry. And that's a fact. You can shake it up. It's a fact, though. It is a, you can check it up online and see what it was the age of marriage in Delaware. The point is this, is that this is not, does not have the, the, uh, creedal disproving implications. This doesn't say Islam is true or Christianity is true or this one is false or whatever. It goes back to the cultural norms of the time. And if someone is sincere, they'll realize that. And if someone wants to come to Islam, ahla wa sahlan. And if someone doesn't want to, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whoever wants to can believe. Whoever wants to can disbelieve. We don't really care, to be honest with you. With all due respect, Islam does not need to be sold to anybody. And Islam itself is what will protect you in the hellfire. Otherwise, you go to the hellfire. It's up to you. I mean, it's, yani, it's simple as that. If you're sincere and you seek the truth, and the truth shall set you free, as the Bible says, then you wouldn't care where the truth comes from. You see. And that's what I have to say about the situation. And I have to go to the next one. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.